All right, so let's get started here. Um, so just briefly, um, what we're going to talk about today is our uh, project at uh, the National Healthcare Institute in the Netherlands, or ZIN. Um, and we, um, um, our project is about the implementation of R at our institution, and we're uh, with four project members, um, um, Mohamed and my, myself, we are here today, and uh, two other shows, Enzing and Amaren Schreusinger, uh, are not here uh, today, but uh, are part of our, uh, our project group. Um, and what we want to talk to about uh, with you is just briefly a little bit of background for um, the use of R within within Zin and how we view R and Excel. Um, then Mohammed will present some uh, results from a survey that we distributed in uh, in the Netherlands, and uh, we will talk about a guideline for submissions in R that we are developing. And then we also would like uh, some uh, to have some discussion uh, with the group. So first of all, just a brief introduction to how we view um, Excel and R within Zin. I think uh, the last few days you've had a lot of uh, very uh, technical and really nice presentations about the, the potential uh, of R and also the benefits of R. And I think um, from our institutional perspective, we also like to take a step back and realize that of course, Excel has also very, uh, very clear benefits that we have really extensive experience with it. It's, it's, it's often, it's, it, is, uh, it is sufficient. Um, it's very user-friendly. Um, people that come straight out of, uh, out of universities with medical backgrounds um, are also familiar with it. Uh, so there's very little training necessary to, um, to handle it. So there are a lot of, uh, of benefits with Excel, but clearly also uh, I think this must be uh, must have been uh, discussed extensively already that you are all aware that Excel has many uh, many drawbacks uh, also, um, and there is clear potential of R also for HGA uh, the decision making, um, but it, it, it adds in the the situation is currently that we've never actually evaluated any model in R, so even though building models in R is already pretty advanced. Uh, within HTA decision-making, it's uh, extremely limited uh, or in the Netherlands non-existent, but we know from uh, uh, um, colleague institutes uh, throughout uh, the world that actually for their decisions, uh, it's also extremely rare to, uh, to evaluate uh, a, a, a technology based on an R model. So our whole project is basically designed to um, to improve that, um, to start working towards uh, a world where HCA decision-making uh, can also be done uh, based on our models. So our project objective uh, is in line with that, uh, that, that goal to facilitate the possibility to submit models in R to ZIN um, by developing and pilot testing uh, guidance. And our project has several work streams. So first, obviously the guideline development. So we've taken some actions already that we have um, spoken to some experts. We've gotten input from a very broad uh, range of stakeholders on what they would expect from such a guideline. Uh, we developed the draft and we finished already our internal consultations and the guideline is now um, being externally consulted. And we hope to finish that um, in June uh, and then probably publish uh, the guideline in the summer. Um, then we've also um, one of the things we got back from the survey that Mohammed will talk more about is also, well, if you do it just with SIN, then manufacturers are not so motivated to uh, actually uh, build models in R because they would have to submit in Excel and all the other, other countries. So we've started the sort of coalition of the willing with uh, other HDA organizations that are interested in uh, working more with R. We have seven organizations already um, um, joining us are six, include, or so seven, including Zin. So we have Cadet, NICE, NSPE in Ireland, uh, ICWIC, um, MPIN in Hungary, uh, DLV in Sweden, um, and um, where, is that seven already? Am I forgetting one? And, Z and Zin in the Netherlands also. So um, we have quite a broad uh, uh, range of HDA organizations already in uh, interested in, uh, in, in collaborating on the, within the field of R. And we are starting a pilot uh, phase where 
we uh, we open up uh, um, the possibility to submit the model in R um, for just a regular uh, uh, evaluation at in, and we're expecting one submission in uh, in July and maybe more later, but um, um, but at least the one in July. Um, so then, Mohammed will talk a bit more about uh, about the survey that we set out and the results that we got back from it. Yes, thank you, uh, Rick, for the uh, for the introduction. I will have you to ask you to uh, to move to the other slide uh, whenever I need to. So uh, be prepared. Um, as Rick mentioned, uh, there are various stakeholders in the field of HTA uh, that are responsible for getting pharmaceuticals towards uh, the patient. Um, and it's also important to gather their ideas and suggestions uh, regarding economic modeling, uh, since they are usually the ones who develop these models, make these models, and the HCA authority usually uh, assesses these, uh, these models. Um, so based on a number of uh, meetings we had previously with uh, uh, some HTA parties and academic consortia, we developed a short exploratory survey uh, consisting of nine questions with the aim to actually uh, gather their opinion and their attitude towards uh, submitting an economic model um, uh, in a different software uh, than uh, Microsoft Excel. We actually sent out this survey uh, to pharmaceutical companies and consultancies that were falling on the Holland Bio and the Dutch uh, Association for Innovative Medicines. Um, and we received some, uh, uh, some nice suggestions that I will uh, lead you through. Thank you, Rick. Um, we received 28 answers. So we had 28 respondents with the majority of uh, respondents from consultancy followed by uh, pharmaceutical industry and academia. Uh, in total, 28 is not a very high number, but at least it, it gives us an idea of what people feel and think uh, in the field uh, itself. We also asked them whether they would like to submit a model in R in the future. And we see here that the overwhelming majority actually uh, would probably use R in the future whereas a, a small part of these respondents uh, prefers to keep using Excel. Um, can you go to the next slide, Rick? And they also mentioned a number of reasons why they would like to keep using Excel in the future. And I think uh, this is a point that uh, Rick mentioned previously as well. The additional hassle uh, to go through if you only have to build one extra model in R for one country. Hence, uh, the alignment that, that Rick just mentioned is quite important for us, uh, uh, our enthusiasts, uh, in a sense. But also, depending on experience and familiarity, um, for some people, it might be uh, an increased complexity. But also, uh, related to that, is that some respondents, in this case, were of the opinion that it leads to decreased transparency and usability uh, compared to Microsoft Excel. Can I have the next slide? Yes. Um, we also asked uh, people uh, to give a reason why they would use uh, Excel in the future. And one very important reason that was mentioned is that in complex disease areas uh, or complex models such as disease models, Microsoft Excel is perhaps not the optimal software if we think about efficiency, running time, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and some functions are not even possible in Excel uh, compared to R. Um, whereas the majority, in contrast to the previous slide, is, I think, convinced of increased transparency of R compared to Microsoft Excel. Uh, checking uh, cells uh, one by one in a very large uh, sheet with 10,000 rows is quite uh, quite difficult. Whereas in, Excel, in, in R, it might be uh, a little uh, more straightforward. However, um, uh, respondents also mentioned a number of conditions to be met. So if pharmaceutical companies or consultancies are developing models in R, it obviously needs to be accepted by a HCA organization such as in 
but also uh, there needs to be a clear guideline, clear recommendations, as well as standardization uh, from an HDA authority such as Zim. And eventually, which is really, really important, and that is experience in using R uh, from both the consultancies and pharmaceutical companies, but also the assessing party that they need to be familiar or they need to have experience in, in, in being able to, uh, to run models, to assess models, to find mistakes, to possible mistakes, uh, um, and so on and so forth. Next slide, please. We also asked the um, respondents what type of software they would use uh, in the future. And we see here that two thirds of the respondents mentioned R. Uh, on the second place, we have Python. We also have a number of other suggestions that were made by these 28 uh, respondents. So we had a total of 30 suggestions of which six were other types of software. Um, think about Java, uh, TreeAge, uh, and these type of software. But it's nice to see that the majority, um, or the majority of the suggestions were uh, to use R in the future. We also asked the respondents how the guidelines should look like. What type of suggestions need to be included in the guideline? And here in yellow, we see that the, uh, uh, the main suggestions, most of these suggestions were to include some kind of recommendations about which packages to use. And we also relatively struggle with that in developing development of the guideline. There are, there is, there are such a large array of packages to be used. There needs to be some kind of um, uh, standardization. Otherwise we would have a dizzying array of different types of packages or not even packages used, but like in the, in the being uh, coding your own uh, stuff. And it might be quite difficult for us as a uh, uh, HCA uh, organization to check that. On the second place, we have uh, the coding standard followed by reporting and folder structure. So what type of coding standard should be used? How should the report look like? Should it be uh, um, uh, an shiny interface? Should we use our markdown? Or should we use a, a separate uh, a Word document together with uh, uh, the, R, the R codes? And as at, at the last point uh, is, regarding folder structure. But in the next slide, we have a number of concrete suggestions that were made by, uh, uh, by these respondents. So regarding packages, we received a number of very useful suggestions. So for instance, for estimating input parameters, uh, I think in a previous uh, presentation, Surf HE was also mentioned, which could be uh, part of this uh, uh, packages suggestions as well. Uh, specific cost effectiveness analysis uh, packages such as the uh, DCA, DAMPAC, HEMOD, and HESIM. For coding, we received uh, concrete suggestions to use the DARTH modeling framework. Uh, the DARTH group is a group that has some extensive experience uh, and has written various papers uh, to, uh, on how to report uh, uh, cost effectiveness models. Um, Regarding report and reporting of these economic models, respondents uh, actually asked Zin to offer a template, but also uh, a suggestion was made to use, for instance, R Markdown, which makes it possible to uh, very quickly uh, uh, include uh, tables and figures within the, uh, the report itself. The last uh, concrete suggestion was to use, an, for instance, an, uh, a R project folder uh, structure. Next slide, uh, Rick. So to conclude, um, based on these 28 respondents, um, we see that there is in general a positive attitude towards using R. Um, however, the main objection or the main condition that needs to be met is that there needs to be some guidance for these parties to uh, submit their models in R. So hence, uh, we started developing a guideline and that uh, will, uh, so Rick will take you through the guideline uh, a little bit. And then after that, I think there will be uh, time for some discussion regarding the results, but also the guideline.
Thanks, uh, Mohamed. Yeah, so um, I will talk a little bit about the guideline that we uh, are developing. So um, I think um, what we're trying to balance with the guideline, um, and we maybe we haven't figured it out completely yet, but we want to standardize as much as possible um, so that it's also easy for our assessors to, to check models, also that we um, collaborate more easily with uh, other HTA organizations, um, and also that it's for the model builders um, straightforward in what is expected of them. Uh, but simultaneously, I think so, yeah, R just requires some uh, measure of flexibility. So, sort of striking this balance is uh, one of the challenges that we have with, uh, with developing the guideline. But obviously, in general, the model should uh, should be very clearly structured, uh, transparent, well documented. We should be able to uh, adapt it to the needs of uh, of our uh, our organization. Um, and then, so basically, based on all our discussions with experts, all the input that we got from the survey, um, our scientific advisory board, we developed a guideline. Um, and I want to talk you through the guideline. So these are sort of the, the chapter levels of the of the guideline. Um, and we start with um, what we would expect from a folder structure. We, we do want to make some recommendations on how we expect the folders to be uh, to be structured because that makes it much easier for us to uh, to uh, check these uh, submissions. So we do uh, um, um, a lot of these evaluations each year, and if they are all structured entirely different, um, that makes it a lot harder for us to uh, to uh, really grasp how the model is uh, uh, functions. So, and it's pretty easy to uh, to keep the same folder structure every time. So we think this is something that we uh, can easily re uh, require. Then about data requirements and maybe i can take that one together with the end-to-end -end functionalities i think one of the benefits of of using r for cost effectiveness modeling is also the opportunity to um, do all the statistical analyses like survival curve extrapolations etc also in in r uh, and included with the model submission uh, the same goes for the inclusion of more uh, or the more underlying data rather than um, um, the outcomes of these uh, statistical analyses. And I think um, that might be something worth um, working to Bart, but at the moment, our position uh, as in is that we would require an R model to at least have the same uh, information, the same data, the same functionalities uh, as a model in Excel would have. So we wouldn't require um, all the, um, 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 for example, the survival curve extrapolations to be included in the submission. So that's our current uh, position on what we would uh, require from uh, manufacturers. Then we also have some, um, um, defined some requirements for how we want the code to be structured uh, with blocks uh, according to an R markdown uh, structure. And we based ourselves on work done with R4HDA uh, from DARF um, about uh, yeah easy ways to uh, to structure your code and make uh, make it uh, more easy to uh, to understand um, and the same goes I think for this following point where um, we look at uh, coding conventions so we refer to the tidyverse as a, a, a recommended way to. Uh, to, um, to write your code. Uh, and then with the extension to more specific cost effectiveness uh, uh, um, coding styles, uh, and, and DARF has published one, we, we don't uh, require the style of DARF, but um, some aspects of the, uh, of the style that they uh, suggest um, we, um, we, we do like. Um, so that's uh, that's something that we also uh, put in the guideline. And then, of course, commenting is extremely uh, important. If somebody has to understand the model that uh, that hasn't actually been involved in uh, in building the model, uh, and I, I I presume that all of you uh, understand that, um, and um, and might even have discussed uh, ways to make that uh, uh, that uh, work as as best as possible. Um, 
then I want to jump to the last point about the submission procedure. So it's more, uh, more practical information on how we would ex expect the uh, submission of the model to go um, as opposed to how it's done in Excel. Uh, and then the, the, the former point on packages and functions, um, we've included now in the guideline a list of packages, which is on the next slide that I will uh, show now. So we, we included this list of packages on the, on the left side, and um, we already had some additional suggestions from people, but we also um, invite you all to make some additional suggestions. So there's this link on the slide, but probably not very easy for you to uh, write that. So I think Mohammed uh, put it in the chat also so that you can follow this, um, this link and, and, and put in some more suggestions for, for packages. Um, and I think, um, here it's organized a bit like packages specific for cost effectiveness analyses and all this preparatory and supporting uh, supporting packages. And this, I think, also brings me to this uh, this last slide that we have on discussion points. So I've listed here five, and I think um, I will just go through all five, and maybe then we can decide which one uh, we can dive in first. Uh, I also have, after this slide, one more slide with our future steps. So I will, I, I propose that I, uh, I finish the presentation first, and then we dive into, uh, into the discussion. So the first point is about um, the balance between R and Excel. We strive to move to R a bit more, but in some cases, Excel is also uh, sufficient. Um, so the question, should we obligate uh, R in some situations or not? And I think currently our uh, position is that we're really um, putting emphasis more on aligning with uh, other HTA organizations um, and having a guideline that is somewhat uh, also internationally aligned really to motivate um, motivate manufacturers to submit more models in R. Um, so we're currently not really thinking about uh, obligating R in any situation, but yeah, we're interested also in, uh, in your, uh, your opinions on that. Um, and the second one is about uh, capacity building. So it's in, um, not all assessors are, uh, are actually experienced with R, um, but we have a team of assessors that uh, have followed courses uh, on modeling in R. I've also all worked with, uh, with these models uh, themselves. And we're fairly confident that as a team, we can um, we have the capacity to at least evaluate uh, models submitted in R. Uh, but this is not the same for all uh, HDA organizations. So capacity is in some situations certainly, certainly limited. Um, so we are thinking about ways to, yeah, to make everybody uh, skilled in um, in uh, the, the evaluation of uh, of models in R, but I think on the other side, on the industry side, uh, this is more or less the same. That uh, in some companies people have experience, in some companies not so much. Uh, some companies also uh, um, uh, let consultants build their their models. So um, the question is, to what extent the people at the companies need to be familiar with our models, but yeah, at least some familiarity is I think necessary. So um, yeah, ways to facilitate getting, I think all uh, participants on a, on, a, on a good level of, uh, of understanding of uh, models in R would be nice. Um, so some suggestions for what, what, what we could do to uh, promote that. And of course, there are already some, um, some courses out there. So that's, uh, that's, I think, already a nice, uh, nice development. Um, then one that we uh, have discussed a lot internally, but actually haven't really figured out yet is that, um, of course, our markdown makes it uh, also possible to uh, integrate reporting with also the, uh, the, uh, the code for the model. Um, and that's very nice, but the way we ultimately publish an, an, an HDA dossier as a, as a government uh, organization is in a way that should be understandable by the public. So we're looking for ways to make this process uh, a bit more efficient that um, 
on the one hand, the company can have a structured format to submit the model, but also this very way more, uh, uh, more broad uh, submission file about what uh, input parameters they've used and the justification for those input parameters and really a lot, uh, a lot of information. And then the translation of um, the model itself and that uh, submission file with the explanations to our final HDA dossier. Um, so um, that's something that we, uh, we're still uh, thinking about. And I think currently our position is that we would we would require the company to um, to submit uh, the model and its technical specifications, and that can be done with uh, with uh, an R markdown uh, file. But we would separately from that expect them to submit um, a file that uh, explains all the choices that they've made in uh, in building the model. Um, uh, so this is pretty similar to what we would expect from an Excel uh, Excel model. Except that Excel models usually come with quite uh, poor uh, explanatory uh, uh, um, files, so we would expect that to be uh, a bit better with our use file. And then this packages issue that we uh, put in the last uh, um, last uh, slide already that we have developed a list of packages that are at least useful, um, but we're still a bit unsure about what we what we should strive for. Should we strive for a comprehensive list of packages and limit, uh, limit the use to those, uh, to those packages? Or should we strive maybe more for a set of criteria that packages uh, should adhere to, to for them to be acceptable? Um, like at least being in the grand repository, but I think that the criteria might be a bit more, uh, more strict than, than just that. Um, so, at the moment, I think we're we're in the position that we're we're saying, well, we have this list of our packages, and at least when you want to use other packages, contact us before you submit uh, submit the file, and then uh, um, then we can we can see if that's uh, that's acceptable. We also want to prevent a bit that um, our assessors need to spend uh, a lot of time getting familiar with many new packages that they are not, uh, not really aware of. Um, because uh, as you probably under, all can understand is that a capacity at the HDA organizations is not, uh, not abundant. So we wanna, wanna limit the, the time that, uh, that assessors have to spend on these models. And then I think it was already put forward in the, in the chat. Um, the use of R shiny, should we obligate it? Should we encourage it? Should we discourage it? Um, I think from the Zin perspective, we would never accept anything that is, uh, that is only the, 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 the user interface. And we would always wanna see the, uh, the underlying workings uh, of, the, of the model. Um, and we are, we are currently not actively encouraging uh, the use of, uh, of our shiny. So these are uh, our discussion points. So I welcome any uh, any uh, discussions in a minute. And maybe just to finalize the presentation is that our future steps is of course finalizing all the consultation and publish the guideline. Um, we want to maybe develop a roadmap to our implementations with the other HTA organizations so that we can. Um, also map all our organizations to where we are and the trajectory to implementation and, and find out what each organization exactly needs at that moment in time. Do they need some help with developing a guideline? Do they need uh, maybe some help with capacity building? Do they, whatever they need. Uh, and of course, run, uh, run the pilots. Um, and then, Maybe one, uh, since we have so many people uh, interested and uh, experienced with our models, uh, uh, one, uh, one request of you. What we're actually quite interested in is examples that we can use to also train uh, assessors uh, in the international HDA uh, arena. So um, we know that there's quite a lot of models published um, with the underlying code and some some descriptions, but um, 
we are actually not aware of any um, models structured according to uh, an HDA submission um, with an with a submission dossier alongside uh, uh, the model codes. If 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 that is uh, is something that any of you could uh, would be willing to share, that would be uh, extremely uh, helpful. And then in the bottom is my uh, my email address. So that's the uh, the end of our uh, our presentation. So maybe I should go back to the discussion points. And Howard, do you want to moderate it a bit, or or should I ask someone else? I think Porik, you're the moderator. Okay, ha happy to do that. Do you, do you want to kick off Howard with some comments? Uh, yeah, but uh, but I think as as we were saying in the chat, we're sort of inviting people to um, raise your hands or put comments in the chat. There's already quite a few people that made. Um, some really interesting comments. So we might want to open the floor to people like Paul Schneider, um, Rob Smith, Dawn Lee, um, and uh, Christopher. And but just one question, uh, Rick, you were saying that you're moving towards uh, mandating R for models, or is it just going to be an option amongst many? Yeah, for now, it's going to be an option. Yeah. So we have no concrete uh, plans to obligate our Because yeah, mm -hmm. that, that's, that, 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 that's the problem we come across with NICE, that they accept our models, but so long as manufacturers have the option of doing Excel, or as long as there are other markets that mandate Excel, R is never going to become the standard for creating these submission models, because you need something that can be used everywhere. Yeah. And in terms of, yeah. Yeah, I think maybe the, a brief reflection on that is, I think I think we're just not quite there yet to obligate it. Um, I, I, I can imagine that um, we would uh, obligate it for, uh, for certain types of models in the future. Um, but at this moment, our focus is really more about uh, aligning the view on R internationally among HDA organizations, because I think if we as in would obligate uh companies to suddenly submit an r um that is also a, a not an, an optimal situation we rather create some uh, international alignment uh, beforehand i mean it is possible that the the academic community and national guidelines will go to the extent that r has been used for everything and then it's only the hta submissions that are in excel and that the situation will no longer be tolerable um, but we're, we're not there yet. Okay, got, I'll be quiet and open. Uh, we've got two hands raised, Dawn and Robert. I'll, I'll go to you, Dawn, first, please. Thanks. Yeah. Um, in terms of obligating manufacturers, obviously we're not at that point yet, but perhaps could provide us some sort of incentive, uh, particularly for models that are more complex, where R is particularly more suitable. So perhaps the more streamlined HTA process allow us a bit of a benefit in terms of the timing, which we can work to. Might be a really good incentive for manufacturers if we can get their drugs out faster by using a more appropriate method. <laughs> That's uh, my first thought. And uh, yeah, probably got some thoughts on the others, but I'll allow Rob to go first. Hi, so I think, um, first of all, just to say, I think you're, you're really um, pre preaching, certainly preaching to the choir uh, here. Uh, and I think everyone's probably very excited about this. Um, and there's a lot to agree with. I think you, what you'll get is kind of lots of people tweaking and saying, oh, you know, we'd like this slight change on that theme. Um, for me, the two biggest things are uh, the kind of proposed um, folder structure and proposed structure of submissions. Um, like there's kind of already a way in which our users communicate their uh, kind of software they've designed, and that's in in a format of a package, and that's already got extensive extensive documentation, vignettes, etc. Um, and so I guess it's why not use that format that's already there. And then I guess my second comment is on other packages, so external packages that are used within the model, and uh, maybe a bit of a concern about um, being too narrow about the choice of of packages that are used. And, and kind of having everybody maybe almost bodge their uh, their model to fit a set of um, previously created software 
where it might not be the best method for that model. Uh, yeah. Yeah, maybe a brief reflection is I think, I think from our perspective, it is a bit of a, of a balancing act because um, of course, if you're building a model, it's, uh, it's probably best if you get uh, as much freedom as possible. Um, but if you're an assessor at an HDA organization, um, uh, unlimited freedom for in the model building process is, um, is not, so, uh, not so helpful for us. So yeah, so we're still figuring out that balance. And I think regarding the packages, your first comment, um, I'm not entirely sure what you're suggesting, but what we probably would not prefer is that each model that we get comes with its own package, because then we would have to uh, go through um, 30 packages each year and understand the, the full construct of those packages. That might not be um, the optimal solution for us. Thanks, Rebecca, this is fine now, thank you. Yeah, I'd like to uh, connect also on the, the question you raised, how to convince manufacturers to submit uh, models in R. And uh, I'm also wondering, perhaps we should also reverse the question in terms of uh, how to convince HDA agencies internationally to accept models in R. Uh, I think that may also be one of the hurdles as, as long as Excel is being accepted by all HDA agencies and R is not then we could potentially end up in a situation that basically two separate models need to be built in order to satisfy the needs of all HD agencies. So I think some kind of harmonization or alignment, at least in terms of acceptability, may also be relevant over here. And obviously we do need to start somewhere, but I think we're in a bit of a catch-22 at the moment. Yeah, exactly. I completely agree. And I'm, I mean, how many HD organizations do we need to convince, right? Because we, I. I we probably won't convince all and we probably also won't convince all uh, manufacturers so right how many is uh how many hda organizations should accept r for a company to be interested uh, i don't know but we'll have to see so we'll go to paul now please hi yeah thanks um i th i think you're doing really amazing and, and super useful work because I would always assume this kind of um, uh, giving a bit of a, a framework and making an upfront investment so that everyone is kind of on the same page to get started would be super useful just to like have everyone on board and get different institutions interested in, in, in having uh, uh, R as an option for HDA. However, at the same time, um, I would think, I'm wondering um, if it would not be useful to be a bit more open in the beginning just because we don't have much experience in R with HDA and so maybe not be overly specific in your recommendations on how people should submit and what packages to use and maybe just have a, spend a bit on more time just learning what might be more useful and what formats are kind of more useful to reviews and so on um, before you commit to a certain way of doing things. Yeah, fair comments, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think that it comes again, I think to the balance and so maybe one point to, to add to that is that Certainly, the guideline that we're we're aiming to put out there in July would not be a de definitive version of uh, of any guideline. So uh, certainly, we would uh, we would want these first uh, first three years and probably after that as well uh, to be uh, uh, regarded as a learning phase. Um, yeah, sure. Just on the point of capacity building of assessors and industry, how to facilitate. Um, so this is something obviously we think about in, in education um, and there are courses at Garth and also one at Bristol. Um, so there wouldn't be that many people within the Netherlands that you need to actually train. Um, so you could run a one-off for 30 or 40 people. Here it is, run it once at the start of the year, once at the end of the year, then that's everyone has the experience and knowledge to do it. Um, would Zin be, could, could you fund that sort of thing or would you mandate for assessors to continue working for you, you have to attend this, or would you even go to a certification sort of standard where you have to have a, a certificate from DART for Bristol to say that we, you can do this job? Yeah, it's an interesting <laughs> suggestion. So budgets, uh, that's not uh, my responsibility, so I wouldn't know. Um, but uh, certainly our, assess our assessors are, uh, are um, um, 
encouraged to follow courses that they need to do their job uh, adequately. Um, I, I, so it is of course not uh, an uh, an institutional view, but my personal one. I think I probably don't think that all our assessors need to be able to handle R, at least not in the near future, because we don't expect that many models in R yet. So I think what we have now at, uh, at Zin is that uh, we have a, a dedicated R team with some people that have extensive experience. Um, and I think for now, that's probably uh, probably sufficient. Uh, in the maybe mid to long term future, you would, uh, yeah, you might consider it as a job requirement or at least uh, something that you, you would um, want your employees to train uh, uh, on the job. Yeah. The yeah, interesting one. I was going to have a little bit of a thought around point three there in terms of streamlining the submissions. So have you given any thoughts to use of, for example, GitHub? Because that's one of the key advantages of using R, that we're able to, for example, agree changes to the model via commits, and we don't end up emailing Excel files backwards and forwards. And then <laughs> um, in terms of streamlining the dossier uh, versus what we've got within the R model, Obviously, we can use R to directly output, uh, export uh, into the submission template, for example. Have you given any thoughts to around uh, enabling us to be able to do that with your, your dossier setup? Yeah, um, we have given some thought about it, but uh, at this moment, um, not, not too much yet, actually. I think this is one of the areas where we, where we could still um, could still um, um, develop a lot further because, um, yeah, I think there are a lot of options or a lot of ways to uh, to streamline it. But for us, it's not so clear yet which way would be uh, would be preferred, and also um, what the impact would be on our uh, already existing uh, existing procedures. Like we already have, uh, of course, certain uh, submission and reporting formats. Um, can we just copy those or do we need to modify them and in what way would uh, would everything um, would everything fit together so that's uh, i think a part that we haven't uh, haven't really figured out yet thanks we'll go back to paul yeah so maybe just to um, um, also explain the second point that i made in the chat um I think one huge potential benefit that R has compared to Excel is that we can very easily separate the model from the data. And so this would allow just like an open sharing of the model and mandatory sharing of the model, which is now with Excel just not possible because people, like companies can say, oh, this is kind of confidential data in there. And if we could separate those and we could just review the model independently and it would be open, then I think this could really help with transparency and with the ability of the model. Yeah, I fully agree. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Frederick. Yes, uh, thank you very much. This is very interesting um, what you're doing. And I was wondering um, uh, what role uh, would you also give to maybe organizations like R4HDA or maybe um, DARTH, uh, the, the DARTH working group? You cite them already, but do you also see a, you know, a, um, uh, any kind of support uh, from them or would you seek some kind of support from them because this is basically also where all the uh, R enthusiasts uh, seem to join and you are doing this already here through this presentation but maybe also in in terms of uh, of your guideline of course yeah so um yes that's a, I think a very good point so um we for, so maybe I should have uh, clarified this a bit more in the presentation. So I mentioned the external consultation, and we decided to go for a more directed external consultation. So we've uh, created a list of people um, that well, for the it was so subscription to that list of dedicated reviewers was open, um, and we also approached a few people from DARF and from R four HDA to be in this dedicated uh, review team. Um, so the external consultation is not uh, fully open, but we uh, consult uh, only this, uh, this external uh, team. And, and some people uh, in that team are from the uh, R4HTA and DARF uh, consortia. So they are, uh, they are consulted on the guideline, yes. So go to Rob, please. 
Just to say that no, we, we've not touched yet on uh, on discussion point five, and I think um, the use of R shiny uh, can be hugely beneficial in improving transparency for those that are not um, kind of programmers, coders. Um, and in theory, we could even, in certain cases, have uh, models deployed online um, for kind of increased transparency for everybody, not just a ERG or committee. Uh, so maybe, maybe, maybe yeah, I can uh... tag on to Rob's point there. I think I discussed a little while ago with NICE the potential to use um, models with an outshining front end live in committee meetings to allow committees to really interrogate what's going on with multiple parameters. That's a major improvement over what we can currently do with Excel. And I think might prevent some of the times we've had to go to a second committee meeting because we're not able to fully see what the model's doing. <laughs> so maybe one to consider for future. <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, j just on point three, um, there, there seems to be you're very keen on markdown, uh, at least for those that are shiny. Um, so I think that our markdown is great for reporting our analyses, um, but just to have a voice of dissent, that it's not necessarily the best way to report the results of a clinical trial or a systematic literature review. So not, it wouldn't be good for all the sections of an SDA submission. Um, also, it introduces an extra technical requirement for systematic reviewers to use our markdown to write the reports or LATEC to write the reports. Um, so just forcing against that. But certainly for detailed appendices on the model, uh, for the modeling sections, markdown is way to go. Do you have a, a suggestion also for um, what we could use in uh, the areas where our markdown does not suffice? Yeah, so I mean, we would the way we work. We, we we work a lot with clinicians or reviewers, economists, or people who don't use R. That they're not happy editing an R markdown document or even a LaTeX document. Um, we have to go use Word, where we circulate back and forth, do track changes, and so on. So I think you would need to do manual combination of a markdown generated Word document with a a Word document that's been written by hand for the systematic reviews and the clinical background sections. It's messy, but and there might be a technical solution in the future. But at the moment, I think combining them manually is the best we can do. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So <clears throat> I've got a general question about discussion point one. Um, so I think most people in this meeting are convinced that Excel is more likely to lead to mistakes and be less transparent in, in some respects. But presumably, some of those mistakes are against the interests of manufacturers as well. So is that a way of um, encouraging manufacturers that the quality of their work will be higher and maybe to their you know, selfish commercial advantage if they were using uh, or instead of Excel, or is that just naive? Uh, Dawn? I'm gonna go with, that isn't at all naive. <laughs> <laughs> Some mistakes obviously are against a manufacturer. And also when mistakes are found, that can create delays. So going to a second committee meeting, and that really is against a manufacturer's interest. And I've had to pick up personally the uh, remnants of that happening to other consultancies and a few points. So that's a big advantage where we don't have that problem. It's <laughs> okay. interesting. Uh, Rob? Yeah, presumably mistakes just include another kind of element of uncertainty into the process. And so if you can remove some uncertainty, that's probably always a good thing. Yeah. Yeah, sorry to keep talking. Um, just on the, the point four about packages and comprehensive list of full freedom. So I think most people here are in favor of a more open list. So not specify you have to use, it has to be restricted to this list. Um, but about criteria for acceptability, um, so we are in favor of packages being validated by the community, though they're used by hundreds of statisticians, so they get detailed checking that way. But if you want to go down the formal route, you could get your assessors to assess packages. Um, so if you want to use if Flex service to be acceptable for HA submissions, then perhaps 
um, DRGs or your assessors should be checking these packages. It wouldn't be as much work as checking a full model. So they could do it for a half or a third of the time movement of a model. And that might be part of your initial building to validate the 20 or 30 commonly used packages for model building. And yes, Leah, that puts a lot of work on the assessors. Yeah, I think that's a very fair point that um, we probably we would prefer validation through the community, I think, and uh, sort of outsource this uh, this task because, uh, yeah, we don't have abundant capacity uh, internally. Um, but then still, you're saying um, a few hundred statisticians. So yeah, is that a criterion that we would use? Like at least uh, 300 statisticians which have used the package or how are we going to define this, right? What, what, what makes a package uh, acceptable? And there's a comment from Andrea uh, in the chat. Andrea, do you want to um, speak on camera about that? Yeah, thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. Uh, so I had really a couple of comments and uh, a question. So two comments were uh, the first one will, uh, to just uh, point to the RM package, which is extremely useful and I guess will save a lot of time and potential errors uh, because it ensures like library dependencies and versions are consistent. Uh, the second one is regarding shiny interfaces. So. Uh, I'm very, a big proponent of shiny interfaces, but they might actually add quite a significant amount of code uh, to review. Uh, so while they could be great uh, in uh, presenting the model, like for reviewing purposes, like it might be problematic, uh, especially if there is a lot of uh, reactivity built into the interfaces. That's uh, several layers of functionalities into the um, into the model. And the third one, which is uh, more more of the question, like is that the restriction in the uh, some packages might actually limit the, the, the freedom we have in our modeling more than uh, it will uh, the, 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 the restriction that Excel itself is. Um, so when we uh, when you're designing these uh, these guidelines, is it more for uh, is the effort more towards like helping reviewers you know identifying data structures, folder structures so that they will expect uh, at least expect to know where the uh, information is or in actually how the model should be uh, coded and programmed sorry that was quite a lot there <laughs> thanks does anyone want to comment on this I, mean, I guess at the in-person meeting um, on Friday, Howard had a couple of comments about, you know, the, the limitations the packages do impose that you are in some senses, unless you want to hack it yourself, which can be almost as much work as doing starting from the beginning all over again, that it is necessarily going to restrict you. And there, there will always be a trade-off that's probably specific to packages and the purposes you want to put. Uh, Rob, do you want to come in on, on any of those points? I think Don's got a really good comment in the chat, um, which says it nicely that there's a huge potential for external organizations to do this kind of validation um, and also to apply for research funding to do this kind of thing, because it's not just uh, ZIN that's going to have this issue. It's going to be agencies all over the world, and it's maybe something for academic colleagues to apply for research funding to do this important validation work. There's, there's lots of agreement in the chat to Don's point as well. How practical is, do, do people think getting that funding and finding a group to do the validation would be? Funding opportunities for software development in health economics is limited, um, but the better methods, better research, the sort of relabeling of the MRC funding stream is a bit more appropriate now. So I think it's, it's better now than it was last year. Okay. Rob? Just to add to that, so they during the, the pandemic, the academic modeling groups building um, COVID models had their, their software uh, reviewed by kind of professional software engineers. 
Um, that's relatively straightforward to do, and it gets kind of a, a green tick that it that it's there's no bugs essentially. And then the next question is: Is the software correct from a health economic statistics perspective? So there's kind of two questions: Is it buggy, and is it uh, doing what we think we're doing from a methodological perspective? And I think our role is probably in the in the latter, not the former. No. Yeah, and in terms of funding, a really important point made by Rob that we need to work with the, the computer engineers. I'd say also it's not just academic funding that we've got as a potential here. There's a lot of industry interest in being able to use these packages and have them validated. So I'd think that would be an additional source we could look to for funding. And uh, we managed to get funding recently with York University to look at uh, new software in terms of structured expert elicitation. So it definitely can be done, <laughs> even just on an academic point. Frederick, do you want to speak to the point you made in the chat about shiny and parameters? Frederick's maybe reference PC. Uh, Paul, you had a comment as well. Do you want to uh, speak to that? Uh, yeah, sorry, I just wanted to disagree with the point that uh, I'm having a shiny interface uh, increases the kind of the, the work of the reviews uh, massively because like with the model and the data, you could just separate the model from the shiny interface and you just need to validate the model and then ensure that the interface and gives the same result. So I don't think it would be, you wouldn't need to review the entire shiny code all the time. Okay, people agreeing with you in the chat, thank you. Uh, Rick, are there any other points you particularly like to cover, or do we feel you've, you've got a fair coverage of the five discussion points you've put up? Yeah, no, I think um, this was actually very, very nice, this discussion. Um, I've also written down some things. I'm going to copy the chat, I think, to um, yeah. to keep track of the of the discussion, but this is very, uh, very helpful. I, I, I probably at this moment, I don't have additional um, sure. sort of questions or points to put forward. No. Yeah. Uh, There's just one new comment from Leah in the chat about distinction between factors for model building and operation and those for generating model inputs. And do we start with model building operation for the package element and the balance between packages when otherwise reviewing new code, if anyone wants to speak to that comment? Uh, Rob? I don't know if this maybe touches on my earlier point on how you'd structure the, the actual model that you're building. And so I think um, what what I, with your proposal, uh, it looked like the structure included things like testing, specifications on how to comment code, um, like how you lay out functions and, and have all your functions in like an R folder, that kind of thing. And I think what you essentially get to when you continue down the route that, that you're proposing is essentially a package, um, and and so I think when, once you've once you've kind of gone down that route, you're going to end up basically building a package with a full set of documentation for a model, um, and that's no more. That doesn't take any more time to review than than reviewing the the code in in a folder. It's just standardized in the way you you structure your folder then. And Howard. Yeah, I think Leo is making an important point actually that we're distinguishing packages that are used for statistical analysis and ones that are used for health economics, because a lot of the statistical analysis ones are already used in Excel models. Um, so if our validation would be more leaning towards um, ESIM, EMOD, BCA, these packages that are not currently used for Excel modeling. And Paul? No, sorry, I just wanted to agree with Howard. Okay, great. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, I, I, missed, I mistook your thumb for a hand, so that's what I was saying. Um, if, if there are no other final uh, comments, um, we're, we're just about at the end of the allocated time for this session. Uh, Rick or Mohammed, do you have any final comments you want to share? or?